All right, well, I have 832 and I know we'll have uh, plenty of questions this morning, so I think we can go ahead and get started. So I will kick things off and say good morning and welcome to our sustainable packaging webinar featuring Adam Springer, Manager of Product Sustainability at Ahol Del Hayes, Ian Pascarelli, CEO at The Kitchen Network, Emily Donaldson, Director of Business Development at Springwork Farms, and Melissa LaCase, the co-founder of Tanbark Molded Fiber Products. And so this event is part of our Food for Thought Forum webinar series. My name is Christine Cummings, Executive Director of the Maine Grocers and Food Producers Association, and we're pleased to be hosting this morning's webinar with our partners at the Retail Association of Maine. We're thankful for the expertise our panelists can share with us this morning. We know sustainability is a big topic and likely one we'll certainly revisit in future discussions. But first, we'd like to take a moment and recognize today's series sponsors who have invested and supported the work of the Retail Association of Maine and the Maine Grocers and Food Producers Association. A big thank you to Hannaford Supermarkets, Poland Spring, Shaw's, Associated Grocers of New England, Bazudos, Altria, CNS Wholesale Grocers, and Pepsi. And I'll hand it over to Curtis. Good morning, everyone. I'm Curtis Picard, President and CEO of the Retail Association of Maine. I'd like to also extend a welcome to this morning's presenters. We appreciate you taking the time to talk about this important subject. A few procedural notes before we start. First, all attendees are muted, so we won't hear each other's background noise and will remain muted throughout the webinar. We will have a question and answer period at the conclusion of the presentation. To ask a question at any point during the presentation, simply move your mouse towards the bottom of your screen and within the black bar, there is a white Q&A icon. You can type your question in the box and click send. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available after the event for interested participants as well. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started um, to kick things off, I'll just ask each of you to do a quick introduction in terms of uh, how you relate to this discussion. So Adam, I'll start with you. Sure. Well, good morning, Christine, and thank you for having us. Um, my name is Adam Springer. I'm the Manager of Product Sustainability for Ajo Del Hayes USA. So my role is, is I uh, work with our brands, which would be the Food Lion, uh, Stop and Shop, Giant Company, Giant Food, and of course, Hannah for Supermarkets on their sustainability initiatives, ambitions, and goals. Um, to help navigate and work towards kind of uh, uh, achieving our targets uh, set forth. So um, again, manager of product sustainability and prior to this role, I sat uh, for 15 plus years on our in-store use packaging desk for the Hanford and Food Lion supermarket. So very nice to be here today. Great, well, welcome. Ian, how about you? Sure, my name is uh, Ian Pascarelli. I, uh, I'm the CEO of a company called The Kitchen Network, and we are essentially a third-party research and development firm. And so I have a team of uh, food scientists and culinary professionals who develop new food products for emerging new companies, but also uh, helping assist with you know, larger national companies as well with SKU line extensions, troubleshooting, scale up, and, and everything in between. So we do everything from salty snack to frozen to refrigerated to beverage to pretty much anything you can think of, uh, we've worked on it. And so we, we are a, a generalist food production agency, and we also work alongside obviously a lot of things to do with packaging and and most of the companies that come to us are sort of uh, on the you know the the newer set of products coming in so the better for you the more cutting edge the more sustainable type products and a lot of that ties into you know packaging and and what they're going to put that product in and so we sort of deal with the whole gamut of concept to creation and retail and scale up and commercialization for food great well welcome and emily i'll ask you to do a quick intro Hi everyone, my name is Emily Donaldson and I am the Director of Business Development at Springworks Farm. At Springworks, we grow organic lettuce using aquaponics, which is the combination of fish and plants in a recirculating um, system. So the fish create an organic fertilizer for the lettuce and the lettuce in turn cleans the water for the fish. And sustainable packaging is something that we're really excited about and um, we're constantly looking to improve. Great. Well, good morning. And Melissa. Hey, everybody. My name is Melissa LaCase. I'm the CEO of Tambark Molded Fiber Products. Tambark is a startup 
We are going to be creating sustainable packaging, custom packaging made from molded fiber. Currently, there are only a, we're going to be doing this with type three molded fiber, which um, has the often the appearance and the functionality of rigid single use plastic, thermoform plastic. Um, currently, there are only a handful of type three molded fiber packaging producers in the US, and all of them are focused on commodities. Custom solutions and low volume solutions for plastic replacement or near shore, shore supply are not available. Tanbark will be in production in the fall, and we will be producing both custom as well as we are looking at a product line of um, more of a, a commodities line that would be sourced, the raw materials would be sourced from Maine, manufactured in Maine and shipped from Maine. Um, and we're seeing indications we can do that at or below parity for what's currently available just because it's local. So we're looking at, or as a sustainable packaging industry, we're looking to enter that local farm to table uh, movement that so many food producers on this call have done such a good job of creating. Thank you for having me. Yeah, wonderful, awesome. I'm excited to hear from you all today. Uh, we know that sustainable packaging must be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, one of the goals is this, of this webinar is to help Maine's food producers, farmers, grocers, and other retailers understand the momentum and focus on sustainable business practices specific to packaging. And so uh, specific to packaging, sustainability um, either has or will likely have an effect on their business, um, whether it's policies that will ultimately have an effect, such as the recently passed extended producer responsibility packaging law, or corporate commitments or ultimately expectations from consumers. So we thought it would be helpful to start the conversation with a bit of background as to the perspectives that you all bring. And so Adam, I wanna start with you. Um, knowing that a recent report has noted that 80% of the 25 largest consumer packaged goods companies are working towards fully recyclable packaging by 2030. From a retailer's perspective, can you talk to us about your corporate commitment and the expectations of your partners? Sure. So um, Ajo Deles is not only a signatory of the Ellen MacArthur New Plastics Economy Global Commitment, we're also members of the U.S. Plastic Pact. And really what that means is we all have a common vision of a circular economy for sustainable packaging, um, meaning we want to keep packaging in the economy and out of the environment. Um, so to that end, we have two time-bound commitments that are extremely ambitious, and they are by 2025 to have all of our private label plastic packaging be either reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And then the second goal is by 2025 to have to use an average of 25% post-consumer recycled content in all our private label plastic packaging. So extremely ambitious goals. Um, and a lot of them quite honestly depend on innovation, um, you know, supplies that are uh, scalable, like Melissa talked about, is really finding those uh, supply packaging alternatives that are scalable and you know can be executed uh, by 2025 in our stores. So as far as expectations for our vendor partners and, and our packaging manufacturers are, it's really twofold. One is um, that they participate and work with us on annual baselining. So that's really uh, helps us stay accountable and identify opportunities. So based on where we are and how we're progressing towards our time bound commitments. And then secondly, that they collaborate with us on uh, sustainable packaging innovation. So really come to the table, ready to have a conversation about how we move from our current packaging format to more sustainable options. Uh, and as part of that second ambition, we've created a sustainable packaging playbook to help guide those conversations. And this playbook um, is really founded on the FTC guidelines around recyclability. Uh, and that really helps drive conversations, helps identify uh, and roadmap where we are, where we need to get to, and kind of some of the challenges there. Uh, and I should say that with our vendor partners and packaging manufacturing, it's, you know, that's our expectation, but they want to, they want to participate. So they're really uh, engaged in the collaboration piece and moving towards uh, more sustainable packaging and being able to design packaging that can be recyclable, reusable. Great. Well, it certainly sets a good foundation. And Melissa, as the leader in this emerging sustainable and compostable packaging manufacturing space, especially here in Maine, can you tell us about how your business is coming to fruition and potentially provide us a bit more um, information from a manufacturer's perspective? Sure. So we 
we're a parallel business to a second generation main company, LaCase and Weston, who has made molded fiber equipment for packaging producers all over the world. And we noticed a need um, about three years ago for this type of packaging. And um, it's really accelerated in the last two years. There's a ton of tailwinds. There's employee expectations as well as consumer expectations. I think what Adam was talking about is also driven internally by employees being interested in their companies being, um, you know, good sustainable um, citizens in their um, business environment. And also um, there's legislation. And so what we're finding is we're not too late, but we couldn't, be creating this solution for people um, at a better time. Um, we have a lot of interest. We're in, this is where we're at right now, just so everybody on the call understands. We um, are standing up a small production facility in Saco, Maine, um, and we are developing products with a few different um, potential partners, and we're looking to have those products in, de in development by September. Um, after that, we'll be looking at scaling up our capacity um, very quickly and being able to, in the next two years, both have a facility in Maine and also other regional places across the US, but also we are looking at the potential of co-locating machines near our um, potential customers. If they have a capacity high enough, they could have the machine right there on site with them, which could also reduce a carbon footprint um, as part of that circular economy we're talking about. So big plans, but right now we're really hyper-focused and we're finding there's enough interest from main companies that use packaging to really fuel us through this first stage. So thank you. Very, very exciting. Um, Ian, with your experience working with food producers and business development, can you talk to us about some key points to consider as companies uh, think about making changes to their packaging? I know it's kind of a big yeah. one. <laughs> No, no, of course. Yeah, I think I think it can probably be broken down to three main points. The first, of course, is cost. The second would be supply chain availability. And the third is uh, is probably performance and how it's actually going to treat your product. So starting with cost, you know, that's the thing that the, you know, the the uh, CPG game is a game of margins, right, with anybody in the in, in packaged foods. So anytime you're introducing a new likely higher cost for a food package, you have to find somewhere to Fit it right. So either you're eating that on your end as the as the producer, and you're building that into your model, or you're expecting somehow to communicate that and get it through to your consumers or the people buying your product that it's understandable you need to increase the cost of your product to to put it in that packaging. And so I work with a lot of early stage companies who come in and they want to have you know that that's part of their main you know they they want to be clean label they want to be what consumers are looking for and they want to be in a sustainable package, but they have to also be able to sell their product at a cost that's reasonable. Um, and when you're starting out at small volumes, your margins are already paper thin. And when you're going into potentially a package that's more expensive, it can be really challenging to meet a, an acceptable margin to get up and running and get started and get to the next stage as a food producer, where you can actually start seeing the feasibility of that in the long term. Uh, so cost up front is, is obviously one, especially when in and, and this sort of leads into the second piece of supply chain avail availability is competition to, to get those packaging items. You know, supply chain, yes, you want to launch in something that's maybe a new to the market, like really exciting package that you can be in, but the, there's a lot of other people going for that too. And, you know, one of the, the, the Kellogg's or the Campbell's comes in and they want to use that package. That's going to make it a lot more challenging for a small producer to get their hands on that package as well, to put their product in. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, and, and the last thing you want to do is launch your product in a package and get it out in the market. People love it. It's fantastic. It's doing great. And then all of a sudden you can't get packaging again for the next six months because it's, it's just not available in the supply chain. And then you can't get your product on the shelves that can, that can kill a retailer. Right. So that, that can just, you know, if they can't get your product, you're going to lose your space in the retail spots. You're going to lose your relationships. You're going to lose everything you've built up until that point. And so it's really important to make sure that you have continuity in your plan with what you're going to put your pet, your, your food into. Um, and uh, I, you know, I think as anybody has noticed, there's supply chain constraints across the board right now, and so it's challenging to to get in there. And you you really just have to make sure you, you can do what you can to maintain continuity. And then the last would be performance: Is your product going to perform as well as it could 
in a package that is not necessarily uh, you know, the ideal package for it. So for instance, there are some plastic films that are treated to prevent moisture migration. So when a product goes through a freeze thaw process, it maintains quality. So like a baked good gets baked, cooled, packaged, frozen, and then shipped and thawed during shipping. That there, there are elements of that packaging that helps prevent moisture from migrating outside of that product through the plastic and, and, and it keeps the moisture in the product during that process. And so it maintains quality of that product over time. I'm not saying that doesn't exist in a more sustainable option in a different type of packaging, but there, there are certain, you know, things that some packaging can do and some things that packaging can't do. And so you, you ultimately want the best performance of your product and you want the best consumer experience with your product when they're eating it. And so, you know, choosing the right packaging is going to get you that far as, as long as shelf life, right? Can this, can this hold my product as long as I need it to on the shelf or uh, am I uh, going to encounter some limitations with that as well? Thanks for that answer. And certainly all points I know we want to jump into further as this conversation continues. So I appreciate that. And Emily, sure. we thought it would be interesting as a farm um, here in Maine who has had product and is making some changes to their packaging to, to join us today. Can you give us a bit of um, history as to what you've been through as you've made changes to your packaging? Yeah, definitely. So Springworks has always made an effort to use the most recyclable type of plastics. Um, and we're actually about to launch a new packaging to reduce our reliance on plastic and just remove it from the waste stream. Because obviously, while we want folks to be able to recycle plastic, um, to and remove it entirely is um, the best option. So just to give you um, an example, this is um, the, one of the types of packaging that we've been using um, up until this point. And as you can see, it's got sort of a rigid plastic top as well as a rigid plastic tray. Um, but something that we're about to launch is um, a very similar design and yet it uses 40% less plastic on um, the top because it's a resealable thin film top. Um, and then the tray, while it's still rigid, it's made out of 100% recycled materials um, and is number one plastic. So it's the easiest to recycle. Um, however, this, while we're really excited about this improvement, um, we're constantly looking for ways to reduce it um, from the get-go. And so while this is an exciting step for us, it's by no means um, the end. And in terms of like other producers who might be interested in looking for alternatives, um, something that we've realized is the the best method is just to keep experimenting. So like staying open-minded, trying new types of packaging, and then just see what works because just because, you know, one certain type of packaging is how you've done it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only option. I think that's a great tip. Thank you. Uh, Curtis, I'll hand it over to you to ask some additional questions. Sure, this has been a great conversation and, um, I know we're already starting to dive into kind of the questions I'm going to dive into, but we'll we'll I, I think I think you guys have set the stage really well. Um, so a recent report revealed that more than 60% of consumers go out of their way to recycle and purchase products in environmentally friendly packaging. So I want to talk a little bit more about consumer buy-in, and I think both Ian and Emily have really kind of set the stage for that. Um, so making but making changes in one's packaging will come at a cost. So Ian, you, you already talked about costs a little bit as you were talking about, um, you know, maintaining the quality of the product as well. But I guess let's kind of let's kind of dovetail a little bit. I mean, we already know what inflation is doing. We already know other cost drivers, cost of labor, other things. So how is an increase in price evaluated from a producer's perspective throughout the launch and evaluation of a business? Yeah, of course. Um, I would say it starts with, you know, it, it sort of depends on what type of producer you are. So if you are a new company and an early stage company and just starting out, you have the opportunity to build out your financial models and sort of pull some levers and toggle, okay, if packaging costs X, where, you know, how, do, how does everything else map out? And what's my final retail price going to look like? And you can at least sort of uh, 
try to stomach that prior to you know getting on the shelf versus somebody who's an established producer who's out there and consumers are used to paying a certain price and you know their understanding of what they're going to pay in the grocery store and then you have to turn that price up and you have to crank it up a few you know a few cents here and there that becomes more difficult to stomach from a consumer perspective um and so it really comes down i think mostly to storytelling and being able to communicate to your to your consumers and to your buyers, whether that's through your website, through, through social media, through in-store language and messaging, you know, how do you communicate, <laughs> how do you how do you tell the whole story of, of supply chain and inflation and ingredients and labor costs all going up in, in a simple, easy to understand message to a consumer? You know, I don't think there's any silver bullet for that, but uh, it's doing your best to find a way to communicate to your consumers, hey, this is why we are doing this, and and perhaps it it, it can be told and through the mission of hey this we're doing this because we're thinking long term and you know the sustainability is an important thing and 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 that's where I think a lot of people try to talk about is hey we're making this change now but that's because we want to do X Y Z in the future, um and uh, and and oftentimes even the earlier stage companies that try and do this so they they you know they plan it out they understand their packaging is going to be more expensive, um there are often sometimes hidden costs that people don't expect when you're starting a new company or you're starting a new venture and and all of a sudden you have to make cuts somewhere and sometimes that more expensive packaging becomes really difficult to stomach um, when you realize you have to meet your margins somehow and so uh, no matter what it's a challenge but i think the best strategy is communication that's great um so melissa can you dovetail off of that i mean you you talked uh before about uh, wanting your prices, your your products to be price competitive, but how does consumer buy-in and cost come into play as you're navigating uh, companies' needs and expectations? Sure. So cost comes into play. Uh, it's very much part of it, but it depends on the market sector I'm speaking with. So for food brands, there seems to be a bit more of a sensitivity around that than high-end health and beauty, where they're just totally fine passing on that cost to their customer. Um, so it, and I shouldn't speak broad, but broadly speaking, that's what I'm finding when someone's paying over a hundred dollars for a four ounce jar of face cream, they want it to be very on brand. Um, and so having, um, packaging that fits with a sustainable lifestyle or a sustainable brand, you know, they're willing to, to pass that cost on to their customers a little more. I'm finding when the food space, there's a little bit more sensitivity around that, but consumer buy-in is also part of it. There's, um, I was just trying to look it up, but there was a study recently done where people, consumers understanding and alarm about a, the amount of plastic and their um, sophistication around understanding how little of plastic gets recycled. I think it's less than 10%, it's called greenwashing. Um, I think that that has um, risen in the last couple of years just because um, it's really been, climate has really been one of the biggest stories probably of human history. Um, and people are starting to realize that. So that part of it. So from the consumer standpoint, it's accelerating the understanding and the pressure I would say I'm hearing from the producers I'm speaking with. Of course, there are people on this call, Adam and Ian, who are probably much more in touch with this and have a better pulse of this. But all of that to say is the people I'm speaking with, this is top of mind and their consumers are demanding it. And they're also aware that not all the solutions are there yet. As Ian said, some of it comes down to performance. But there's a lot of innovation that's going to be happening in this space, especially around type three molded fiber, which we're focused on. It's a hundred year old technology. It was actually patented in Maine hundred years ago, but the innovation in that space is really accelerating because there's so much demand now that wasn't there before. 10 years ago, we knew this, we had this solution, but nobody would pay us a penny more for anything but plastic. So we're finding a couple things right now. One is, some are willing to pay moderately more, a little more, some aren't, but there's enough that are willing to go above it and pass that on to their consumers or make sure their brand is able to communicate what they're doing to their consumers. But it's increasingly a volatile place in terms of plastic packaging. And we're finding that we actually are surprised at how close to plastic packaging we are with our solution we're able to come. So to answer your question, because of so many factors, one being some of the only ways to get smaller volume type three molded fiber is from overseas. 
we're finding we're below what people can get. Supply chain issues are nobody wants to be that vulnerable again in terms of their supply chain. So they want nearshore stuff that they were willing to have overseas. So there's this whole slew of um, factors that are driving business decisions towards um, willing to either take on the cost, pass on the cost, or find a different solution and then finding that the solution actually has cost parity. That's incredibly helpful. Thank you. That was, that was really great. Um, Emily, you already were talking about Springworks new packaging. And of course, I think those of us here in Maine are already very familiar with the Springworks brand and what you guys have been doing. Um, but obviously, you have a larger footprint with Hannaford outside of Maine. How are you going to be communicating um, your, your new sustainable packaging in your marketing? Um, and do you anticipate it's going to help long term with customer loyalty? Yeah, definitely. So it's something that um, we've we've highlighted on the new packaging itself, just so that when folks are looking at it and maybe, you know, it's on this wall of salad next to other sort of stiff, rigid packaging, you know, they'll be able to see that reduction for themselves. Um, but it's also something that we plan to highlight in, in any other um, marketing material. But our customers are so sustainability conscious to begin with that I think um, they'll be excited about this type of reduction. But I also think um, the eagerness from the consumer side to see more sustainable packaging options also gives us more flexibility to experiment in that space, um, which is so important because I think what stops some of that trial is the, um, you know, the concern of like, well, how will it be received on the shelf? And um, and so I think that consumer demand is so key to giving producers the permission to really change um, in really fundamental ways that, you know, 10 years ago, they might, we might not have felt um, so confident in doing before. So it's an exciting time, I think. And if I can follow up quickly, can I ask how long it took uh, in terms of a time frame before you guys were feeling comfortable that you can roll this out into the marketplace? Um, so we're a matter of weeks in terms of like actually getting it launched, but I think we're a bit of a unique situation just because I think 10 years ago, I don't think many people would have assumed that aquaponics would be, um, you know, back, back then, I don't think people would see an issue with shipping lettuce from California and Arizona and other water stressed regions or see the issue with um, synthetic inputs that, you know, come at a huge cost to the environment and the folks who are interacting with them. So um, I think it's one of those fortunate timing aspects. And, and like Melissa said, I think moving forward, there's, there's a huge opportunity here to sort of couple the packaging. I mean, that's the first interaction a customer has with our product. So we need to make sure that our packaging reflects our values. And when, when we see innovation in this space, um, I think we certainly will. And I think a lot of um, other producers will will take the chance and really um, see if these like alternative materials can be something that works. And you know, if it if say like the first trial doesn't go well, um, I think we're pretty lucky that we work in a collaborative space where we can go back and be like, oh, this is our biggest challenge. What what are some of your ideas um, to address that? So I think there's a lot of safety nets in place, both socially and from the consumer side um, that allows us to experiment. Thank you. Adam, let's shift a little bit to the retail perspective. Um, as a company takes steps towards being a good steward of the environment, how is it being communicated in the retail space? And what are you seeing specific to in-store merchandising? I would say, First and foremost, we can do better as far as the in-store communication goes, but I would say what I'd like to point to um, is really, and Emily kind of touched on it a little bit, is on pack labeling. So what we're implementing and rolling out is the how to recycle logo, because I think that's paramount. Ian kind of touched on it a little bit as well as Melissa. Um, it, it's paramount that not only customers demand will drive innovation, but in Emily's situation where she's using 40%, I think she said in her packaging of post-consumer recycled content, <clears throat> supply is critical. Supply of that post-consumer recycled content is gonna drive uh, innovation and infrastructure. So I would point to the How To Recycle logo, and really that is, if you're not familiar with it, is a standardized labeling system that explains to the consumer 
and it really takes the guesswork out of recycling. And I think that's, and we'll get back to it later in the conversation, the biggest opportunity um, is simplifying recycling. So the how to recycle takes the guesswork out of it. It's based on the FTC guidelines and it really explains uh, and helps the consumer navigate um, what their packaging is, how they can recycle it and what's not recycled. And I think that's key too, is not only do we put the how to recycle logo on if it's recyclable, but we also put it on to identify that this package is not recyclable. And quite honestly, if that transparency is we wanna make sure that the recycling streams maintain are clean, that the yields may, are high, um, and that we're working towards identifying viable solutions, but packaging performance is so critical. Um, you know, it's the packaging and the quality of the product, they go hand in hand. So I would say for us, it's the how to recycle logo. At the Hannaford brand in particular, another thing I would point out is the produce department. They're really uh, focusing on providing customers with options and educating the customers. So you'll see in our produce departments next to the single use produce bags, um, signage that talks about reduce, reuse, and recycle. The fact that you can bring these produce bags back to the front of our stores to recycle them after you're done with them. And also that really helps educate the consumer around the fact that we have options. So on our produce bags, the single use produce bags, you'll see a clip strip to the side, reusable produce bags. So it gives the customer uh, kind of a quick education and then provides them with options of, hey, if I, I can't afford reusable bags today, I know that I can take this bag and then on my next shopping trip, bring it back, recycle it, keep it in the economy and keep it on a landfill. So those would be the two that I would point at. Christine, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, um, thank you. As we talk about consumer buy-in and both from a philosophic and a monetary perspective, I think it's important as we have this conversation to touch upon infrastructure and accessibility. And I think that's a, where Adam was headed in some of his last comments. Um, so as consumers become more interested in knowing where their food comes from, the desire to understand where the product packaging originates and where it will end up is certainly increasing as well. And so, Ian, I'm going to kick it over to you and say, as your client, have your clients dealt with evaluating environmental trade-offs as they've explored alternative packaging options? Um, for example, using a glass jar where there is a market for glass, yet it's a heavier material versus a lighter weight material with a lower carbon footprint, but potentially less options to recycle. Can you talk to us about whether or not you've had some of those conversations with your clients? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and I think even the example you used is probably one of the best ones to, to reference. So, you know, anybody entering the beverage space, uh, and, and there are a few factors that, that go into this decision making process and sort of like why it happens in this way. But so somebody starting a beverage company entering the beverage space, they will want to produce in lower volumes and the, the filling lines that fill in lower volumes are likely being able are going to be able to fill in glass bottles. And uh, it looks good, you know, it's classy, they can see the product, there are a lot of, you know, good things about glass, but it's super duper heavy. And beverages are heavy in general as well. And so when it comes to shipping costs, you end up eating a lot of costs, especially in now people are trying to get more into the direct to consumer market, shipping a glass bottle beverage to somebody uh, in direct to consumer is just incredibly expensive. And so, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of companies start out with, hey, I can get time on this, on this smaller line where I can produce a few thousand bottles and I can get my beverage brand up and running, I can put it in glass, and then they almost inevitably, eventually, will have to switch to something else that's lighter and cheaper and easier to, to fill. Um, glass breaks as well, right? So you get breakage and, and you know, there are just issues with that, that can happen with glass. And especially as you start getting into higher volumes, you probably want to be in something, again, that's a little bit lighter and a little bit easier. And so, so many times I've seen people start out in something like a glass bottle and eventually make the switch to a plastic bottle just because it's just something they had to do to make the numbers work or, or something they had to do to get the volumes up on the product that they wanted to produce and, and get into more retail stores. Um, that being said, what we've seen the most now, and again, I'll reference the beverage industry, is, is we've seen a humongous push towards as aluminum cans, right? So getting back into aluminum, and a lot of people want to be in now aluminum bottles for the resealing ability to re reseal a bottle as a beverage. Um, but you know, we instantly saw supply chain constraints on that, where everybody wanted aluminum all at the same time. 
and nobody was able to get it, you know, unless you're buying a, a you know, in the, by the trailer truck load and the smaller companies can't necessarily afford that overhead. And so, it, you know, there are a lot of different factors that end up becoming challenging um, with that. And so it's, it, it's difficult for the environmental trade-offs. Sometimes, you know, they're just depending on the type of product you want to be. So if you want to be a sauce that is in a squeeze bottle, you know, there aren't, there aren't really very many squeezable products that are not plastic, right? How are you going to, how are you going to be in a container that can be squeezed if it's, uh, if it's, you know, a glass container can't be squeezed, aluminum container can't be squeezed. And so, you know, you run into very few options for sustainable, squeezable packaging, depending on the type of product you are. Um, and so there are different, different factors that affect it, depending on the type of food product you are. And, uh, and, and again, what's the use case scenario for how your product gets used? Um, and so there, there's a lot of different factors that make it challenging to be in a more environmental, environmentally sustainable package. Um, but again, it, it goes back to those three original factors that we talked about first, you know, cost, supply chain, and um, I hope you what was the last one, cost, supply chain, and then yeah, performance. How's it gonna work, right? How's it, how's it gonna perform for your product specifically? Thanks for that. I know as um, Curtis and I speak um, and testify at the State House, I find myself constantly speaking to the importance um, that food packaging plays in, um, you know, in shelf life and food safety. And so hearing that um, you continue to say those similar points is um, helpful. Um, Melissa, from a infrastructure perspective, as you're working towards compostable products, can you speak to where Maine and or New England is in terms of end of life management for compostable materials and any opportunities that may lie ahead there? Sure. So um, again, I don't want to overstate that I'm not the expert on this, but I've been speaking with the University of Maine um, Mitchell Center for Sustainability, and they're doing a lot of work on trying to figure out how to make it actually less about um, feeling good what you throw in the compost pile and actually have it work at the end of the day. And so from those conversations, it's kind of the wild west I'm finding with compostability. Um, it's just a really difficult um, nut to crack. Um, we are at um, Tambark never going to use PFAS. Um, we're talking to chemical suppliers who are looking at developing alternatives for PFAS. I know that that is also a very difficult challenge. Um, but one of the things our supplier is looking at is making sure that what they have is compostable as well. Um, so with talking with the Mitchell Center, what we're finding is that we're probably going to have to work on a more regional level to kind of figure out how to make sure that our products are seen as compostable, as opposed to maybe some of the other products that EcoMain and the University of Maine have identified that say they're compostable, but you really can't put them in the compost bucket. A lot of those materials that you see that say they're compostable but have to be heated in an industrial facility and there's all sorts of challenges to making them compostable some of them actually have plastic in them to bind them together so there's just um, a lot of misinformation out there i've told some of our investors that our our real competition is greenwashing <laughs> Um, but that again, consumers and producers are becoming much more sophisticated around all that because they care. Um, so to answer your question, it's not there yet, but we're working. There's so many like Maine is amazing because it's the first place to ban plastic on uh, any level outside in the United States. I mean, the EU has banned it. Canada's banned it. Lots and lots of other places are ahead of us there. But Maine is first among equals, I think, in the United States. But also there's so many small food farmers, there's so many small food producers, there's so many groups here that are sustainability focused just because it aligns with their values and their brand that we can now go to EcoMain and work with them on, okay, how do we do it so it's actually right? Not so that like, let's start with what's actually compostable in our packaging and figure out, okay, if we know where the source is, we're sourcing it from Maine pulp, we know the supplier and we know that it's coming from Maine trees. We know our recycled content that we're mixing in is coming from, we're looking at Portland Press Herald cuttings off the, off the paper floor. So like if we can know to a very, very, very detailed extent our supply chain and then we're responsible when it comes in our door to what happens to it, we can then um, be um, really honest about what's going out in a way where we can prove it. And so that might be able then to have people be able to throw their packaging into the, into the compostable box. 
Thank you for helping explain that. I know um, in conversations I've had, there's um, some unknowns around the um, term compostable and, and what folks have access to in terms of how they dispose of um, that particular packaging type. Um, Adam, I saw you shaking your head. I don't know if you have any follow-ups in terms of, um, you know, the role that the consumer plays in sort of this um, consumer proactive post-purchase um, realm. No, I, Melissa's spot on, and that's kind of to my comment of simplifying the recycling and, and just the whole process for the consumer is because it is, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of confusion and a, a label of compostability. Um, again, the majority of it is needed in, to be composted in an industrial com compost facility where the infrastructure isn't there, especially in the state of Maine. But that packaging, if misinterpreted, could also contaminate our plastic recycling waste stream as well. So, I mean, folks think they're doing the right thing by putting it in to their blue bin or, or you know, recycling it, that that has, it's a huge contaminant. So it is, it's a lot of noise and it's really simplifying it for the consumer. So that was, I was agreeing. There's a lot of, um, you know, get back to the science and make it simple for the consumer. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot what your question was. No, that's okay. I was just asking, um, actually, one of the questions that came in um, during the discussion is um, expanding upon, you know, consumer pre consumer demand pre purchase um, doesn't necessarily turn into consumer um, proactive post purchase behaviors. And so how do um, retailers embrace and communicate options. And, and that gets back to the how to recycle label that that is a huge opportunity is that post purchase participation. Um, that's what's going to drive the this innovation and and for the uh, it, it'll drive innovation plus supply and investment in infrastructure is once the consumer gets it home they understand what to do with it they actually execute on doing it so recycling it or composting it um, so really that consumer engagement education and I'm a big proponent of uh, convenience standards as well making it convenient so um, we own part of that to help that to be convenient for the consumer. So they understand, they get that packaging that is required because it, it's gonna protect the product, which is, has a bigger impact on the environment if we, if we waste that product um, to make it convenient for them to be able to recycle it, um, be it curbside or at a store um, or at a, a recycling facility. Melissa, did you have a follow-up? I saw you come off mute. I didn't know if you were going to add something. Oh, I just, I think I agree so much with Adam that a lot of this is going to be about consumer education. Um, so one of the things where we have the ability to emboss on our packaging. So one of the things we're talking about doing with some of our off-the-shelf products that we'll be developing is just main fiber, main labor, main shipped, and, you know, just trying to show people that this is a traceable resource and truly compostable. You know, there's just, again, this is the Wild West. I think a lot will be figured out in the next decade, but being at the forefront of it here, we're just really moving forward with, it sounds like what Adam's group is trying to do, which is just trying to make sure that what we're doing is actually what we say we're doing. Emily, and that springboards uh, to a question I had for you. As you all explored new packaging manufacturing partners, did you also take a look at the manufacturer's sustainability practices? And um, do you communicate that in any way? Or if we can talk to a little bit about how you found your partners and the importance of um, their practices. Yeah, well, I think what's so exciting, and I think Adam and Melissa both touched on this, is the consumer education side of this as well. Like, we certainly really believe that the sustainability practices of anyone we work with is really important, but also ensuring that they give us the flexibility to consistently improve. Like we don't want to lock ourselves into something where we're like, all right, we're gonna plateau here. When especially there is so much innovation in the space right now. Um, so that's, that's important to us. But I think what's exciting is that to have producers and sort of you know, packaging manufacturers and retailers all working together to ensure that that these messages are being communicated in a clear way where consumers can feel confident in the information that they're receiving and then make decisions on, you know, which product to buy, for example, and and how to deal with the packaging after, you know, if they've consumed, you know, in our case, lettuce. Um, and and what's cool is I think um, in Hannaford, you've, you've seen, a, an increase in like shelf talkers and different marketing communication ways where, you know, there'll be less of an impetus on 
producers to be like, oh, we don't want to switch packaging. You know, this is the way that we market. And this is the way that our message is coming across. But you go into produce sections now and you see signs that tell the stories of producers um, and, and see that as like another opportunity for people to tell their story that doesn't rely on, you know, a rigid plastic case. So um, to see this type of collaboration in the space is really cool. It certainly is. Uh, Curtis, I, um, I know we want to be cognizant of folks' time this morning, but we certainly want to have some questions that look ahead. So I will uh, turn the questions over to Curtis to ask about sort of what opportunities there are as we all continue. All right. This has really been a great conversation. And um, I'm going to springboard a little bit off this last round. Um, so Ian, you know, you, 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 you mentioned a lot of things that resonated with me. First, you talked about, um, uh, you know, packaging that for condiments or otherwise that need to be in a squeeze bottle. And I, I think of my own family, my, my son loves tacos and he loves sour cream on his tacos. And so he absolutely loves the, the squeeze sour cream versus the one that comes in the rigid plastic, you know, small container type thing. So, you know, not want to, I don't want to dwell too much on the challenges and negatives, but and I'm also thinking of, you know, some of the packaging that's designed for a specific purpose, you know, over the counter medications have to be childproof or, you know, some, some products that, and this is going to resonate with Adam, um, are real targets for theft. And so it's packaged in such a way to try to deter theft. So how do you balance all those things with uh, packaging that, you know, would otherwise be, be sustainable, but may not meet some of those other goals? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So product performance is a challenge, right? And, and, you know, there are certain constraints, as you said, you like the child safety, um, or, or just, you know, the way the product has to be used that you're really up against. And sometimes it, it essentially becomes a bit of that chicken and the egg scenario, right, where I would love to have a, a different solution for this, but it doesn't necessarily exist yet. Um, and so that that's where it comes down to, you know, business to business communication and communicating to people like, like Melissa's company, right? Like, hey, I would love to have a solution for XYZ, you know, how can we work together towards this and all the way through to the legislative level, right, where it, it has to be a, a full circle effort to get something like that to, you know, to make the change happen. And so businesses have to communicate their needs. Um, rather than just, you know, sort of sucking it up and sticking with what they're used to, they're starting to be more vocal and they're starting to, to reach out more to the manufacturers and to partner with packaging manufacturers or partner, partner with, you know, legislative groups that can help push this effort forward to help move everybody in the same direction. Um, and so, yeah, uh, for, for a bit, you're beholden to what you have access to, but, you know, squeaky wheel gets the grease and, and so make some noise and, and, and you know, try to advocate for, advocate for what you're looking for and what you'd like to have. And, and hopefully you can start to see some more of those solutions pop up like Melissa's company or, or some other companies that are really working towards how do we create more options for these businesses that are, you know, the consumers are asking for it. Now the businesses are asking for it. And now we need to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So it's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily exist in every circumstance. And if it doesn't, then you just need to try to find a way to talk to somebody who can hopefully help you make it happen. Um, Adam, I'm going to jump to you a little bit to kind of springboard off of that, because you've also talked about, um, you know, the, the steps that are being ta taken to improve and clearly communicate to consumers which packages are recyclable versus non-recyclable. But I know, you know, Christine and I, when we've been working with this issue, we also learned that not all communities are the same. So just because something is recyclable in one community doesn't mean it's necessarily recyclable in another community. So how... How does a retailer, and this is really a question for all of you, how do you, how do you navigate that? And then taking kind of a further step back, I know one of the other challenges Maine has is just simply our geography. You know, we're a large state geographically, but small population. And I think, you know, hopefully in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be more regional approaches to some of these things and determining what is and isn't recyclable. Yeah, Curtis, that is a, a great point. What I would say is, you're right, there are regional challenges that we have to overcome. The What we can control is designed for recyclability, to move it to recyclable packaging. Um, and then I think in conjunction, and I don't know if it was Ian or Emily that mentioned it, but policy, 
right? There's policy, especially in the state of Maine, we, we are the first state in the union to have an EPR policy. Um, I, I think that will help move the needle around if we're doing our part to design that packaging to be recyclable. Um, and again, I should also mention that really is the last level we want to pull as far as a circular economy, you know, really look at reuse and reduce. But if we have to, you know, use packaging, let's make it recyclable, um, it really design it so that looking at the future state. So where will the infrastructure be? Uh, where will the investments be to actually make that um, recyclable at practice and in scale. So we, we use uh, FTC's guidelines around if the consumers have, you know, 60% access, 60% of the consumers have access to recycling facilities. That's really how we, uh, that's the foundation of how we design for recyclability. Um, but you're right. It, it's just so fragmented. I, I think the number is, and I shouldn't quote it because I don't know exactly, but I think there's like 9,000 different municipalities and each of those have a little variants on what is recyclable and what's not recyclable. Really, we've got to kind of standardize this, move towards a regional um, recycling infrastructure, standardized definitions, you know, standardized on what is taken back and end markets for those. And I think it starts with the consumer, you know, consumer demand on one end and then consumer participation on the other end. That consumer participation is going to increase supply, which then is going to have a direct impact on investment into infrastructure. So that's a long-winded answer. I apologize, but I, I hope I answered it um, or made sense there. No, that that's good. I think that's that's an important part of this conversation. And um, you know, I'll actually kind of spring back to to the beginning. Um, I think Melissa, you talked about you know your raw materials really being commodity based, and so a lot of the materials we're talking about recycling wise are all commodity based, and we've seen the the markets for those items really swing wildly over the last five years. So if you make the conscious decision to move into uh, you know, a more sustainable, recyclable material, but then you're at the whims of, of market forces uh, to those raw materials, how do, you, how do you navigate that moving forward? Was that question for me? I guess so, or Adam yeah. or anybody, but yeah, but to, you were the one who, who talked about using commodity-based raw materials. So I guess I'll start with you if that's okay. Um, just to just to be very clear, what we were talking about with commodities is currently the type three producers in the United States only deal with commodity level orders. And the, what makes us different is we're going to greet people in that lower volume space. We're going to make packaging in that lower volume space for um, for um, businesses that need it. Um, but in terms of our raw material, part of what we're using as raw material being pulp, we're looking at controlling for that in the future through our industry contacts and also through other inputs that we have in our manufacturing process. Um, but at the end of the day, there is what we can control and what we can cannot. Um, but one of the things that we are seeing that is um, creating some tailwinds behind us is that there is volatility right now with the price of plastic and the price of other packaging. That whereas in the past molded fiber might have been too expensive, there's all these different factors going into it, which is advancement in molded fiber um, and how it's produced, which is really, really being driven right now by people like us, but also other companies out there too are working on the problem. Um, the cost and volatility of other forms of packages and then um, the shipping costs and the supply chain issues of the last few years, which just um, have really I think exposed that we've over flexed our globalization muscle plate maybe a little too much. Um, and so this concept that the consumer and both the producer now want to um, have their um, raw materials, the manufacturing of those raw materials and the output and shipping of that material come from a more regional level. Thank you. Uh, Emily, I'll, I'll close with you, then I think we're going to jump to Q&A, but do you have any key lessons learned that you can share for food and beverage producers as they begin to consider making changes to new to a new packaging company or as they begin to explore more sustainable practices? I think, I think that this panel is a really good example of what, um, what I think we all benefit from, which is we're all working towards the same goals, but we're doing it from, you know, whether it's from retail or the producer or, you know, a packaging company. So just having these conversations and continuing to trial new options and um, do it together so that, you know, it doesn't feel like anyone's sticking their neck out. Um, 
alone, which I think is probably what holds people back um, the most. So I think the biggest lesson that we've learned is just to just to keep experimenting. Can I speak to that? I've seen something in the beauty industry, which I thought was really interesting, and I'm sure there's something happening in food in this space. But um, I would I would just say what Emily has said a few times about partnership and experimenting, like that's really what we're seeing as the places that we're going to find the solutions for first or the places where we're all like, what are the pain points? Let's figure it out together because it's so new. Um, but also we're seeing in the beauty industry that a whole bunch of competing brands that are sustainability focused have formed something called the Be Beauty Collective, where they together are trying to work with one another to find solutions to pain points that they all have. Um, one of them being packaging. So just throwing that out there that there's different ways to solve it through experimentation and partnership. And like you said, Emily, working together. Definitely. Christine, if it's all right, I can jump right into the first question because I think it springboards off of that last yeah. point. Yeah, <laughs> I was just um, going to say that. <laughs> yeah, one of the one of the participants wrote, "I'm coming from the nonprofit world, so they don't fully grasp the concepts of competition and trade secrets. But I'm curious if and how food companies like Springworks might be partnering with competitors to increase demand um, for your products." Mm, I think. I think packaging is uniquely positioned for something like Melissa described in the beauty industry. That's really neat to hear about. And I think it, you know, it creates a format that we could potentially work with others. And because we certainly don't have any trade secrets surrounding packaging. Um, and I'm, I, I don't know of any other company um, that is in our space that, you know, has, would be defending their packaging um, either for any reason. So. I mean, we would be really excited to talk with others about um, working together on sustainable packaging options. And I will say there's, there's a, there's, um, this is what I'm seeing is when I talk to someone and I say, look, if we develop the solution, are you okay if we sell it to other people? And everybody said, yes, we just want the solution. <laughs> um, we don't need to own it. So that's been a really interesting um, thing to see and heartening. And I would say to dovetail on what Melissa and Emily said, we're seeing that in the CPG world today. They're developing um, innovative solutions around packaging. And it's kind of like an open, uh, I don't forget the terminology, but basically an open patent that they're willing to share because we're all moving in the same direction, right? If you look, Christine started this morning's conversation with the fact that 80% of the 25 CP, top 25 CPGs have these goals. Well, as far as there's, 500 signatories to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, all of them have committed to have 100% um, compostable, reusable, recyclable, or compostable packaging by 2025. Um, and many of them have this, you know, adding post consumer recycled content to their, their packaging. Um, so we're all headed in the same direction. It's the only way to get there is to collaborate and to share best practices, um, challenges, and, and thought partner around. Uh, solving for uh, opportunities that we're seeing. And I don't want to get, I just want to give a shout out that Emily is one of those people that we talked to about potentially in the future developing something and was very open about saying, yep, just solve the problem. So <laughs> I want to just give her props for that. No, thanks. I mean, I think it's such an exciting thing to see Tam Bark working on because there hasn't been, there hasn't really been a company that's, that's fit that niche where it's like the same values of sustainability, but also that regional approach and that farm to table um, mentality, which is really special. And it is really cool to also see large retailers um, investing in that and recognizing the importance of, you know, how do we all work together to communicate to consumers you know, not only the differences between all of these different packaging options, but also, you know, how best to manage it after, after they bought it. So it's, it's really exciting. And I'll go ahead and follow up on that too. Emily, a question we had specifically posed to you, and I think Adam, um, you spoke to it a bit, but um, the reduced plastic uh, container for salad used less plastic um, and you will convert into a non- um, recyclable format, um, how do you balance less plastic versus non-recyclability? And so we talk about reduce, reduction, recyclability. And so can you kind of talk to how you prioritize that? 
Ooh, that's a really good question. So um, I'm gonna lift the example again, just to um, so that everyone can see it if they hadn't before, but the, the tray is 100% made out of recycled materials. So this has already been recycled once, but it's also number one plastic. So it's the easiest and cleanest to recycle after someone buys it. But um, as they pointed out, instead of having the stiff top that we had before, it's now a really thin film. And while um, number five plastic is, you know, it's a film, it's recyclable, but it's, it's definitely not the easiest to recycle. Um, and it doesn't result in like a really high quality plastic. And this is a discussion that we're constantly having at the farm about trade-offs. Um, and we ultimately decided that reducing our plastic consumption and also putting it into the, into the consumer stream um, by 40%, was ultimately worth it, um, just because, you know, once a consumer buys it, we can't guarantee that um, all customers are going to recycle it. And so our top priority is on reduction at the moment, but um, we certainly do not want to prioritize alternatives that are not recyclable or, you know, compostable. And so, you know, we're certainly looking at other options um, in the future. Like we're excited about this reduction, but this is not the end for us. Um, so, you know, pivoting off of that, um, would any of the speakers have names of compulsible packaging suppliers that they think are good? Um, you know, and we talked about things that are, say they're compostable, but not really compostable, or, you know, only really being compostable in an industrial setting. Um, and I've certainly encountered that in my family, you know, like we get something at home, it says compostable, but you got to read the small print that it says it's only an industrial, or you try it in your home compost bin and it's still there a year later. Are there good suppliers out there? In a year, I hope the answer is tan bark for everybody on this call. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a that's a difficult question. It's I I don't know of any off the top of my head. It, 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 yeah. Very high hopes for tan bark. It, it depends on the type of package, I think. So, yes and no. <laughs> it's the answer. There are, there are some. Um, and again, are they affordable? Are they available in small volume, depending on the size of your company? It's a whole lot of factors that goes into it. Um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, the answer is not enough. But yeah, there's a, there's a few. <laughs> there's a ton in R&D. I mean, I, I see, especially in the European market, a ton that, that that's getting there. But the Ian's point, it's the scalability. Um, you know, how scalable is it and how consistent is the supply so as they go from r d to um you know on shelf testing it, it that's really the trick so it is and emily had referred to it uh, excuse me melissa had referred to it as well it's the wild wild west so we're still navigating that um you know kind of focusing on what's proven today and then continuing to look at innovations for compostability Awesome. Well, that we do want to be cautious of or conscious of, of time this morning. So I think we'll work to wrap things up there. Um, we do have a few other questions coming in. And I think if anything, we've learned from you all that communication and conversations are going to be really uh, critical as we move forward. And so um, if anyone doesn't have any questions afterwards, or they'd like to connect with folks, please certainly reach out and, and we can work to do that. So uh, again, just we would like to conclude by recognizing um, our series sponsors, Hannaford Supermarket, Poland Spring, Shaw's, Associated Grocers of New England, The Zudos, Altria, CNS Wholesale Grocers, and Pepsi. And a big thank you um, to everyone who took time out of their busy schedules to join us this morning. And we will be pausing our Food for Thought um, for four Food for Thought Forum series in April, but we plan to be back um, with some additional conversations in May. So please stay tuned and thank you all again. It was a, a great chat this morning.